In response to the United States' support of Israel during the Yom Kippur War, the Arab countries began a massive embargo on oil on dozens of countries. A compromise was not reached for months, leading to oil shortages and severe traffic that substantially affected the daily lives of millions of people. October 6, 1973, 7,000 miles away from America, a series of events were about to take place that would inadvertently affect millions of American lives. In the tiny country of Israel, thousands of Arab soldiers invaded, overwhelming the nation. But in a world divided by the two biggest superpowers dominating the earth, no conflict can avoid international interference. Americans were soon involved supporting Israel in the war against the Arabs. But supporting Israel comes at a price, and America would have to pay a hefty cost for supporting Israel. The year is 1972. American oil consumption in the form of gasoline and other products was on the rise. Meanwhile, domestic oil production was declining, leading to an increasing dependence on oil imported from abroad. Despite this, Americans could not care less about a dwindling oil supply or a spike in gasoline prices. Washington policymakers were confident that the Arab oil exporters could not afford to lose the revenue from the U.S. market. This was all proved wrong. In October of 1973, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, led mainly by Arab states, declared an oil embargo on America for supporting Israel in the war against them. The Yom Kippur War ended shortly after, but the gas embargo and limitations of oil continued on sparking an international energy crisis. They weren't prepared for it, and for many Americans, they'd already seen a lot of economic pressure already leading into 1973, so the um, pressure at the gas tank, other ways that they saw prices rise, was really hard economically. More than two million barrels a day of oil we expected to import into the United States will no longer be available. We must therefore face up to a very stark fact. We are heading toward the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger flew to Cairo for his first meeting with Egyptian President Sadat. Four days later, the two are able to reach an initial agreement with each other. Back at home, oil prices continued to be on the rise. Washington politicians were proved wrong as the Arab states made more money as they increased the price per barrel of oil more than made up for the reduced production. In just three months, the price of a barrel of oil quadrupled. Americans now face gas shortages like never before. When it was available, the cost was so much it was better not to buy gasoline at all. American life was changed forever. Canada, the Netherlands, and Japan also affected. And um, of these, Japan was probably as much as the United States. They'd always, uh, were, they were not a, a country themselves that were able to supply their own oil. Um, and so they, um, they felt a lot of the kinds of pressures that the United States felt, felt and probably in many ways even more so. January of 1974, by now a barrel of oil cost nearly $10, the modern equivalent of $50. Secretary Kissinger makes another trip to Egypt to meet Sadat once again. The next day he flies to Tel Aviv. Egypt and Syria accept an agreement on and stop the fighting. But Israel still occupies part of Syria and are now only 20 miles away from Damascus. Kissinger promises a settlement between Israel and Syria and manages to take Israelite forces out of the Sinai Peninsula by January 18. This was enough to convince OPEC to lift the oil embargo in March of 1974. However, Kissinger still had to finish the job. In May, Kissinger goes back, this time to broker a deal between Damascus and Tel Aviv. After a month of hard negotiations, Kissinger manages to make a breakthrough. On May 28, 1974, Israel approved a disengagement agreement with Syria. Signed in Geneva on June 5th, it brought the war in October to an official end. There were a few people within the Nixon administration who really 
believed that we should go into Saudi Arabia in particular, which is the country that had the most oil reserves, that we should go in there with force, with military, and actually try to seize the oil fields, the army, and to actually bring in, you know, tanks and so forth. It will require some sacrifice by all our we are allocating reduced quantities of fuel per aircraft. Now this is going to lead to a cutback of more than 10% of the number of flights. Now all of these actions will result in substantial savings of energy. Kissinger may have ended a conflict in the Middle East, but back at home in the U.S., little changed. Oil prices continue to stay at their high prices, and the U.S. economy continues to suffer from an economic recession. The national government was forced to take action in order to reduce U.S. oil consumption. In 1974, a national maximum speed limit of 55 miles per hour was imposed through the Emergency Highway Energy Conservation Act. Under President Gerald Ford's administration, numerous other measures were also taken. This included the creation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and the International Energy Agency. Despite the oil crisis ending at last, it did not leave without leaving a bad legacy. So for the first time, my parents had to order up oil that was delivered to the house, and it was just extremely expensive. And so our house for that year was just really, really cold. And uh, we kept the thermostat really low, never got, you know, we were never allowed to put it ever above 70. It was usually in the 60s during the winter. The oil crisis shook consumer confidence. People were spending less because of the high gas prices. Drivers woke up before dawn or waited until dusk to avoid the lines which often snaked around blocks. Gas stations posted color-coded signs, green when gas was available, yellow when it was rationed, and red when it was gone. States even introduced rationing methods based on license plate numbers. The high gas prices also resulted in little money being left to spend on other goods. in combination with the Vietnam War, uh, with the emerging scandal that would become Watergate, uh, uh, for a lot of Americans, it made them start to wonder whether they had as much power in the world as, um, as they thought they did. We have become increasingly at the mercy of others for the fuel on which our entire economy runs. In two and a half years, we will be twice as vulnerable to a foreign oil embargo as we were two winters ago. We are now paying out $25 billion a year for foreign oil. Overall, less money was spent worsening the already bad economic recession. Meanwhile, this was a victory for OPEC. OPEC now found new power to control global oil supplies and prices. For the U.S., hard times will continue for the rest of the decade as new conflicts arise. American lives were changed forever. It was not long until foreign fuel-efficient cars from Germany and Japan took over the American car market, while U.S. car manufacturers lost huge profits attempting to compete. However, the oil prices were not all bad. It was a moment when Americans were really starting to think about the way that maybe they could change course and think about energy conservation, think about the alternative fuels, think about other ways that they could kind of power America. It also led to a need for better sources of energy and a need to lower reliance on foreign sources of oil. Alternative energies, transportation, and technologies have all grown out of frustration, fear, and desire to never again see this kind of damage that was done in the year 1973. To strict conservation and to the renewed use of coal and to permanent renewable energy sources. America must get to work producing more energy. Large amounts of oil and natural gas lay beneath our land and off our shores untouched. While it may be a long time before the entire world goes green, the crisis led to huge revolutions in which we harness our energy.